me. Amen. Those of you who are here for the first time, Fahami means divine understanding. It is also the name of the new Kemetic culture founded on the background of our ancestor worship. Our due reverence to our noble ancestors, ancient and divine, whose wisdom graced the land of Egypt, Ethiopia, Arabia, Chaldea, Canaan, and the entire Torrid Zone, from the Torrid Belt of the mystic name Ethiopia. Fahami. Before we get started, I would like to commend Brother Kofi, and remember to take that word back to your father, that we commend him on the marvelous job that the Savie organization did on for the outstanding job they did yesterday in celebration of the Juneteenth. Uh, we'd like to also thank him for allowing us to be here again at Savie. Uh, Lynette is always very instrumental in uh, getting us here. We'd like to also commend him. Now, first thing I would like to do is ask a question. I really would like to know from you, at least a couple of people, why we're here this evening. I know some of you were asked to come, and some of you are here simply because of that reason. But what is it that we hope to gain from being here this evening? Understanding. We got understanding. One more. Okay, you're all right. But what I like to do is synthesize all three of those things and say that we're here to learn. Whether you are the learner or the learning, you must still learn. Think about it. In order to learn, what must we do? And feel free to blurt it out if you have, if you feel like, you know, you know the answer to the questions that I ask. To communicate. That's correct. All those things are correct. But in order to learn, we also must study. To study means to investigate. And we investigate by asking questions. So to get to the root of a thing, or to get to the bottom of the thing, we must ask questions. Whether it is a, whether it is a question that you ask to yourself, or whether you ask someone else, we must do the research. We must do the digging to find out what it is that we want to know. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get out your pens and your pen and paper and put on your thinking caps. It's time to do some learning. One thing about learning is that you can always do it, no matter how much you know. You can always learn. The Fahami Rasu, founder of Fahami, was Paul Nathaniel Johnson. Peace and the blessing of the Most High be with him. He proclaimed his prophethood in the year 1919. He was called the culture prophet. So I think it's fitting that I give you our definition of culture. Culture means to worship your own most high God, your own saints, saviors, gods, and goddesses. Those that do not do this are devoid of culture. Painting, art, 
and dancing is not culture. And singing adds very little to it. Culture is education in farming, industry, and trade, as well as art. It is the science of government and power and the knowledge of law and justice. It brings order out of chaos and makes a man fit to meet his God. Keeping that in mind, brothers and sisters, this thing is all about you. Welcome to the classroom. And understand that we are not here to placate on your emotions. There is a place for that on just about every corner in our neighborhood. If you came here tonight for temporary, pleasurable moments and for theatrics, then you come to the wrong place. This is a classroom. Now, if you get satisfaction out of serious efforts in advancing or elevating yourself and your people to a higher level of benefit, then you come to the right place. The learner for tonight is the Fahami High Priest, Pita Ra. He is a brother who has learned his lessons. He was taught by the adept Sheikh, High Sheikh, Wabra Samahi, and the High Imam, Habib the Hawk known to many as Dickey, the co-founder of Matthew Dickey's Boys Club. Boys and Girls Club, now it was Boys Club when he first uh, founded it. The high priest has earned the right to stand before you this evening and has a lesson of significance. One that most of you have not heard the likes of before. That being the case, why am I still talking? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, angels, future gods and goddesses, I introduce to you the Fahami High Priest, Pita Ra. <laughs> hey, young man, it's getting to be a tougher and tougher act to follow. <laughs> But in his uh, words of introduction, he said something that occurred to me yesterday, and I did not, uh, I didn't say anything about it. I didn't really know that it would have fallen upon deceptive ears. But he mentioned Dickie Ballantyne, who is the co-founder, along with Mark Matthews, of Matthew Dickey Boys Club. Well, as things Occur. Last night we had a family reunion dinner, and although it does not, it no, the building no longer bears the name of Matthew Dickey's Boys Club. We actually held our dinner in the first original home of the Matthew Dickey's Boys Club, and most people are clueless. And prior to it becoming Matthew Dickey's Boys Club, it was Bob Russell Sporting Good. Mm -hmm. Bob Russell bought a place way out in West County someplace and donated the property to the Matthew Dickey's Boys Club. And that became their first home. Prior to that, as many of our organizations do, they met house to house, basement to basement, things like that. But that was the original home of Matthew Dickey's Boys Club that uh, we chanced to have had our family reunion dinner at. Just a thought that came. Let me say in opening that I am very, very pleased to see new faces. Welcome. As the brother said, I do hope that you leave here with an understanding of something that maybe you did not understand before. I'm not here to make you feel good. I may, in fact, hurt your feelings. But if that occurs, you may need to examine your feelings. 
because we are a people that need to rule beyond feelings and emotional based responses to the serious issues of life. We are well past that point. So this is the seventh, I think, uh, lecture in the series, The Need for Culture. And the title of this particular installment is Perplexity of Plenty. The title, Perplexity of Plenty, was developed from a statement made in the essay, Cotton is a Curse, which was written by Paul Nathaniel Johnson, the founding prophet. The term perplexity describes the quality or state of being mentally perplexed or puzzled, having or facing mental or psychic complications, difficulty in developing an understanding of reality, a state of mind filled with entanglements, having a distraction of mind caused by doubt or difficulties, a mind that is rife with confusion. Perplexity in abundance is exactly what is encumbering the uplift and advance of our people worldwide. Perplexity. In this essay, I will show you how this state of perplexity is created and maintained by our oppressors and by our own unwitting people. Let me begin by taking a look at the subject, at a subject rather, that is popular today. That subject is, quote, the law of attraction. Anybody have not heard of that? Someplace around and two fro going is the, the secret or whatever its name is being known or passed around as now. It's all the law of attraction. Well, the law of attraction has received a lot of attention from a lot of people lately. The law of attraction itself is a fundamental organizing and building principle of both the universe and the world in which we live. Fundamental, meaning that you cannot function and have being without it. However, as regards our people, the attention this universal principle is receiving is not being directed for use in the most sublime purpose that this principle supports. Rather, it is being used to provide instruction in the garnering, hoarding, and accumulation of riches and the continual debasement of our nation. While there is nothing wrong with the garnering of riches, the hoarding of riches is not in conformity with the law of prosperity. And Mayat, I always end up referring to the symbol on the board on the wall behind me here, Mayat. And Mayat requires equilibrium. The Fahami Rasul says that helping one another is the key to prosperity. This means that helping one another to grow and succeed is the requirement for racial progress. Brother Kofi understands that. Know what his group is all about? All right. Helping one another to grow and to succeed is the requirement for racial progress. The Quran says that fighting in the way of Allah, which is also synonymous with the race with your property and your life is what God loves so again you have that reinforcement from another people's perspective remember in Fahami the terms race and God are synonymous we can look around us and say that hoarding is what the dominant culture is engaged in also but that is not true if you study the history of the rise of the Western or Nordic culture, 
you will find that in the beginning of their rise, up through the period of about 50 to maybe 100 years ago, advancement of their race was their focus. Not the individual. Advancement of the race was the focus. Albeit, that rise was at the expense of other nations and the rights and property of those other nations. And so we learn that helping one another to achieve common goals is the key to our racial or national success. As I continue with this lecture, I would ask you to ponder some of the following thoughts. What is attraction? What is the law of attraction? What is a thought? What is thinking? What is constructive thinking? I'm going too fast. I'm trying to write it down. Stop me. I'll back up. What is creative thinking? What is a faculty? How are faculties used? How many things to ponder was that? Just draw a number, doesn't matter. Five, eight, six, seven? Eight. Eight, okay. So let's see if we're going to cover all eight of those. If we don't, make me go back. Bahami science teaches that man has 144 faculties, of which only a few are partially developed, or they are under developed. The ones that we are particularly familiar with are those of sight, sound, smell, taste, feel, intuition, discernment, precognition, and a couple of others. Anybody don't know what the ones I named off of? You don't know what they mean? Sight, sound, smell, taste, intuition, precognition. Could you explain precognition a little bit? I'm sorry? Precognition? Precognition is to know a truth in its entirety before, or, or you can know an event in its entirety before it begins to unfold. Almost like premonition. Premonition doesn't rise to the level of precognition. Pre premonition is more on the order of glimpse of inspiration. Some further questions I would ask you to ponder are, what is the conscious? We all think we have one, we all say we have one, we all advocate we have one, or we all believe we have one. What is it? What is consciousness? What is the subconscious? Does the mind direct the conscience, or does the conscious direct the mind? What is power? How is power developed? exercise, controlled, and the like. And finally, how many kinds of power are there? A failure to be able to answer these questions in our own cultural context has brought us to the point where we need to seriously address the miseducating of our people in America and elsewhere in the world. Say that again. A failure to be able to answer any of these questions that I pose in our own cultural context, not according to somebody else, but in our own cultural context. If we can't do that, then we need to seriously address our people being miseducated here in America elsewhere in the world because that education cannot and will not lead to freedom and elevation of us as a people. It's not going to happen. 
Since 1919, we in Fahami have advocated that a proper education for black people would teach black people how to return to what is rightfully his culturally and how to anchor himself on that culture. Only a return to the correct cultural foundation will allow black people to develop pride of self and race and provide the impetus to stand up as a people in unity. What we are lacking is an educational system to teach black people to honor their fathers and their mothers, their ancestors, to emulate their own heroes, past and present. Without this change in educational direction, black people will continue to be baited along as is now being done for the luck and the success of others. Without this change in education, we will continue to be a source of constant irritation to other nations and also to our own race. A lack of self-love causes us to be a source of irritation to our own people. In the course of our history, here in this country, since emancipation, there have been several occasions where black people have tried to do their own thinking, only to be circumvented by egoistic whites whose only interest is in perpetuating a concept known as white supremacy or Aryan dominance. Today, the same circumvention is attempted each time we step forward in the name of assuming control of what we are taught and how we are taught. A review of the activities associated with the entire Afrocentric movement is all the testimony necessary to illustrate this fact. How is this debilitating condition of black people perpetuated? Let's take a look. Mental misdirection is used to achieve the objective of thwarting self-direction or determination by black people. Every time we set out to do something, a project comes up to misdirect us, get us off the course that we're on, over towards something else that we're led to believe is of greater significance than what we set out to do. Misdirection. Misdirection is the art, not accident. Misdirection is the art of directing the mind, attention, and energies of our people to a place or topic or activity other than where the real activity of benefit to the race should be carried out. For instance, coming together and pooling our resources to establish a financial foothold and be able to build a black-based economic system was and continues to be thwarted by redirecting the energies and attentions of black people to other matters, such as integration and getting an individual piece of the American pie. Not to build a racial pie, but to get a piece of the American pie or Nordic pie, not your pie. They have created an illusory American pie and then they cause us to lust after a slice of it, rather than encouraging and allowing us to develop a desire to bake our own pot, which in turn would lead to the development of a means to accomplish that task. Educationally speaking, the concept that one plus one equals two is valid anywhere teach it. One plus one will equal two anywhere it's taught. That concept can be learned as well in a black institution as it can be learned in a white institution or a mixed or integrated institution. The problem, 
The problem is that when left alone, we may start to envision controlling our own curriculum to address the unique needs of our people. And so to be sure that when left alone to our own devices, we don't start to teach a viable black culture, integration or inclusion as it is now coming to be known is skillfully forced upon us to ensure the continuation of the teaching of Nordic culture and values as being the only solution to the problems of not only the black race, but also of the world. What has been the effect of this Eurocentric policy upon the lives of the black race? Fahami Rasul addressed this phenomena in particular in chapter 19 of the Holy Fahami Gospel. In chapter 19 of the Holy Fahami Gospel, the Fahami prophet posits that civilized greed has robbed the black man of industrial incentive. And now he is told, help yourself. Civilized religion has made the black, or has the black race nailed to the cross of superstition, and he is mockingly told, get out. Civilized culture has fed him on the crumbs from its table, and now tis wondered why he cannot think. Civilized amusement has increased the fickleness in him, and now his vanity is wondered at. And finally, civilized fashion mongers put him on parade, and then withdrew to laugh it off. He then summarizes this situation as perplexity of plenty for these dusky sons of hell. Let us now take a look at each of these conditions and determine what understanding we can get from them. Let me start with the statement, civilized greed has robbed the black man of industrial incentive, and now he is told to help himself. Comes the question, what is civilized greed? Greed is an excessive desire or lust, which is usually uncontrollable, to acquire or possess more than one needs or deserves, especially more material wealth. It is a reprehensible acquisitiveness or an insatiable desire for wealth. It drives one to engage in whatever activities are necessary to achieve or satisfy this desire. The result of exercising this drive to acquire and accumulate more things is the erosion of values that builds and uplifts the soul of man. Greed breeds dishonesty. Greed breeds unscrupulous behavior. Greed breeds unethical behavior. Civilized greed is activities of greed that is sanctioned by a society. Civilized greed is evidenced by the loss of moral rectitude within that society. And that, brothers and sisters, is the key. All right? What is moral rectitude? Moral rectitude is a society's adherence to rightness of principle or practice the exact conformity to truth or to the rules prescribed for moral conduct, either by divine or human laws. Rectitude expresses an uprightness of mind, an uprightness of character, integrity, honesty, and justice. These character traits were known by our ancestors as Mayat. Uprightness and character is a consequence of being both honorable and honest. Thus, civilized greed has robbed us of rectitude. Rectitude pertains to rightness of principle or practice. Rectitude promotes exact conformity to truth or to the rules prescribed for moral conduct either by divine or human laws. Rectitude builds uprightness of mind, uprightness of character, integrity, honesty, and justice. Rectitude leads man to make the right 
judgment. Rectitude is needed for us to properly use the law of attraction or any other universal principle of growth. Rectitude will not allow the sanctioning of misbehavior with the intent to make that misbehavior a profitable venture. It will not do it. It will not do it. This is a delusion. Unethical actions are not inherent in our nature and therefore will not yield success for us as a nation. The systems that we need in order to foster and grow the correct mental and moral rectitude do not now exist and we must reclaim our culture if we are to again produce men and women of high character and noble bearing. Our civil, religious, and educational training must all have the same value teachings and be respected and enforced by each of us if we are to be successful. Brother Ron Neferaman explains civilized greed in the following words, quote, we must also understand that the chief source of obstructions to the realization of the good life, success in career, family, health, and etc., originates in the unjust economic, financial, and governmental schemes that the people in power have devised to control and exploit the majority for the gratification of their lust for pleasure. He wrote that in the Metanetta, Volume 4, page 130. What is the industrial incentive that we are being robbed of, and how does that robbery occur? The terms industry, industrial, industrious, in this instance, all refer to the capacity of the race to exhibit habitual diligence in any worthwhile undertaking, whether it is physical or mental. It refers to the persevering determination to perform a task. It is exemplified by the ability to be steadily and perseveringly active in a particular pursuit or aim, other than sports, to have a persevering determination to complete a task. Our self-determination has been substituted or replaced with a dependency mentality that suggests to our mind, why should I do it when I can let someone else do it and then I can reap a benefit from their efforts? Coupled with this dependency mentality is an attitude that supports graft a clamoring for anything free or at low cost. We fail to see and understand that all offers of free and low cost are designed to draw the supplicant to the will of the provider of the free and low cost goods, items, programs. As I was taught many years ago, quote, gifts make a boy out of a man. Stop letting people give you things. Next, outside of the family we're talking about, okay? Next, let's look at the word incentive. Incentive is any motive power which inspires or gives direction to the mind or operates on the passions to guide you in a specific direction. Incentives are energizers, and energizers provide their own power to initiate or to undertake a determined action or to follow a determined course. Incentives themselves are not fulfilling, but incentives carry the promise of fulfillment when the objective of the incentive is realized or obtained. Give examples I have note to myself. Love, and I'm going to assume we have all experienced what we call love, all right? Love is an 
incentive. But love in itself is not fulfilling. It is the sharing of that love with the object of that love that is fulfilling. Love itself is just an incentive. Uh, you see her and say, oh man. But you can stop there. Right? Never fulfill. You can see her or she can see you. Same thing. You've got to act on it. You've got to act on it before its power is expended. It's only an incentive. Other incentives. Hatred. Hatred is an incentive. It's not fulfilled until you do what? Act on it. Use the energy that it brings to carry out its objectives. Financial gain is an incentive. Got too many children here for the next one. Uh, joy. <laughs> joy. Pleasure. Pride. Notoriety. All of these are but incentives. We've got to learn to choose proper incentives. Because without proper incentive, we fail to mobilize our resources to achieve even those things that are easily within our reach. That much gathers more is true on every plane of existence. This is the law of attraction at work. To have more of anything simply requires putting the proper thought into existence and empowering it. No more, no less. It's just that simple. A problem we have is that we attempt to use universal principles for personal rather than racial gains. And therefore, in this effort, we fail. Hence the teaching of the prophet that, quote, with all, helping one another is the foundation of racial prosperity. Again, talking about misdirection. Through misdirection, our people are being led to use their motive energies in directions that do not best benefit the race. Thus, there is a net outflowing of energies and products or money away from the black community to the parasitic communities that feed off of the disorganized black community. We must begin to heed the direction of the Fahami Rasul where he says, quote, Save your money and your labor and build your own homes. Now we come to civilized religion. What was that last one? Civilized religion. All right. Now we come to civilized religion. We are told that civilized religion has nailed us to the cross of superstition, and we are mockingly told to get down. Civilized religion is any religion that is divorced from providing explanations of natural phenomena. The occurrence of natural phenomena promotes investigation into its occurrences. Instead of inquiry, which produces a culture of growth and information, we have been given a diet of statements such as, relax your mind and don't worry about nothing. Place yourself in God's hands. Accept things as they are. Whatever happens is God's will and it is not meant for man to understand. And they go on and on and on and on. All of those are the products of civilized religion meant to stymie our racial growth, or for that matter, the growth of anybody that those things are being fed to. And then you wonder why those in control remain in control, and those seeking a piece of the pie is always seeking a slice or a piece of the pie instead of a whole pie of their own. Civilized religion. All of these things are in opposition to the mindset that made our ancestors great. Every one of them is in opposition to it. 
When investigation of phenomena is lacking, superstition fills the void. And that is because the mind needs something to anchor itself to. The mind requires an understanding, a basis for logical progression in life. Absent a basis for a logical progression in life, we do not progress, we stagnate. We must free our minds from the restraint of our negative religious thoughts and opinions. Our ancestors investigated all phenomena. There was nothing they did not investigate. And as they learned of the principles and forces behind each phenomena, they attached symbols to them that readily provided an understanding of what occurs when you see that phenomena in action. Some illustrations of the symbols they used are the feather. What does that mean? What does that represent? What is that talking about? What lesson is that teaching? In our, death, in our death scenes, in the Hall of Judgment, you take the heart of the deceased. It's placed in a balance, right? You know what a balance is, right? All right it tells you how much something weighs. To be judged a true, noble, righteous being, that heart could weigh no more than what? A feather. Could weigh no more than a feather. Which simply means it was not laden down with all of the draws, <sighs> negative opinions, and all of those things that stymie a person's growth. Your heart weighed against the feather and the balance. That's what that meant. That's what the feather was used to symbolize truthfulness, uprightness. Another symbol used by our folks. Exactly, put it all in here. They made it a little bit big. But you ever see any of the statues uh, of our ancient uh, ancestors? They stand up on what is called a plinth, all right, which is a piece of stone beveled in the front, rectangular in shape. You know what that plinth represents? Not gonna give, you're not going to be graded. You don't, you don't have to worry about it. And, and there are no wrong answers. But I don't know that you don't know until you tell me you don't know. Family. I'm sorry, somebody say what? Family. Is it family? No. It's a principle, not an individual. Not power. Very good answer, though. It's That plant represents truth. Okay. What does it represent? Truth. Truth. Now you can go pull out all your books on ancient Kim and everything else and pull it out and you get through digging, you're going to find out it say represents truth. So when a person is standing on that plant, what is it saying? They stand on what? Stand on truth. Now, that concept was borrowed. Who borrowed it? Greeks. Masons. Close. Who? Masons. Took Masons took a little bit of it, but religiously speaking, is what I'm saying. Who borrowed it? Catholic. Catholic Church borrowed it. Catholic Church borrowed it. And they put the words in the mouth of Jesus that said, What? Thou art Peter. And upon that rock, I do what? Build my church. That is an Egyptian symbolism being appropriated by Romans. And it's a lot more. Okay? They also have words coming out of somebody's mouth that say, in the beginning was the word. Right? Who said that originally? See the importance of knowing your own history? Mm -hmm. Those 
Paul's words were originally spoken by the god Pita. Get you any good book on, on, on Egyptology and see, he said that thousands of years before Rome got a hold of it and twisted it to use for their benefit. So we've got uh, the feather, we've got the plant, which is a symbol of the bedrock required for the construction of noble character, soul, or institution. And there are many others, and I encourage you to investigate them. They were not just primitive artist conceptions of things. They were symbols embodying great truths. Truths that we're being led to not go back and find out, discover, learn, and reproduce. Most importantly, reproduce. Let's talk about civilized culture now. Civilized culture is a culture in which the necessities of life, food, clothing, and shelter are produced by a minority group within the culture without participation in the production of these things by the people that will ultimately consume them or benefit from their production. Without an understanding of the effort required to produce and sustain a standard of living, people grow lax in their effort to protect their ability to create and originate. Say that again, make sure you understand exactly what I say. Without an understanding of the effort that is required to produce and sustain a standard of living, people grow lax in their effort to protect their ability to create and originate. I see a couple of heads going up and down. Anybody else get what I'm saying? All right. What is, what, what is this the result of? Civilized culture. culture. Civilized culture designed to teach you you don't have to do all the things necessary to sustain and promote and protect yourself as a people. Look to me, I'll take care of everything. And as most of you know from just your regular, having lived a while, when somebody says, don't worry about it, I'll take care of everything, what usually happens to you? <laughs> You're going to be done in. All right. All right. Our failure to provide our offspring with an understanding of the effort required to produce and sustain a higher standard of living is the reason they are lax in an effort to create, originate, and be a producer of meaningful things. Working a job, let me, let me, let me get everybody's ear perked up. <laughs> Working a job is not production. It simply means that you are a wage slave. Now, I probably hit somebody's toes. I may have hit somebody beside the head, but that is the reality, and I need to tell you that. When industrial drive is lost and an attitude of dependency develops, it is not evident to the consumer, or at least it is not interpreted as dependency as long as there is an abundance of things required to make life enjoyable without real effort to secure those blessings for ourselves through our own efforts. All right? Need I say that again? All right? When industrial drive is lost and an attitude of dependency develops, it is not evident to the consumer, or at least it is not interpreted as dependency, as long as there is an abundance of things required to make life enjoyable without real effort to secure those blessings for ourselves through our own efforts. We're in a time of transition, people. We are in a time of transition. And none of what used to be None of what we grew up uh, 
expecting and thinking of as comfortable and it's always going to be there. It's changing. It is changing. Want to see what's ahead for us in this country? Go to any good news source and look at Greece. Look at Greece. Greece today, here tomorrow. It's coming. And who's going to be the real victim of it? Us and poor white people. The black race, like many others in America and the world, have been deluded into thinking that wealth and prosperity can be achieved through debt accumulation rather than creation. That is a sad reality, but it is something that until the time it all starts falling apart. Now let's go to civilized amusement. Civilized amusement has increased the fickleness in our people, and now our vanity is wondered at. Civilized amusement is the organization of entertainment venues for the purpose of diverting attention away from things which we as individuals and the nation should be focused on. It is designed to prevent the mind from reflecting and seeing the true state of affairs that confronts us. There was a time when pleasure and entertainment was reserved for the celebration of some work or notable achievement but not any longer. Mm -hmm. Organized entertainment is designed to replace the drive and determination to see a task through until its completion. This is achieved by the disruption of constructive activity to engage in amusement. When a constructive activity is disrupted, so is the energy flow or the incentive to act. Right? Amusement relaxes the mind and scatters concentration, focus, and the concentration of forces available to reach success. And that's why you have some people known as workaholics. They start on something and they will not come up for air until they have accomplished what it is they set out to do because they understand that when the focus and concentration of forces available to them are broken and scattered, it causes the need to refocus the mind and the efforts in order to get going again. Amusement causes the squandering of resources, both mental and psychic, since during amusement, Attention is diverted away, and the ability to capture glimpses of inspiration is lost. Fickleness is not being fixed or firm. Fickleness increases liableness to change, unstableness, a changeable mind, and a lack of firmness in opinion or purpose. The result is a vain disposition of entitlement to success without the effort to foster that success. I'm saying something you like, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Civilized fashion mongers put us on parade and then withdrew to laugh it off. Fashion mongering is the intentional focusing of the mind on appearance without standards of dress. It is the lack of standards which have allowed the introduction of the monstrous concepts of fashion styling that are now pervasive in our community. We justify our participation in being overly fashion conscious by pointing to the people other nations have sacrificed to follow the new trends that they have established in an effort to keep black people bound to following trends 
set by the fashion models. We are thereby taught to dress in all manner of outlandish ways and to think that we look good. <laughs> and the rest of the world stands by laughing at us while determining what the next ridiculous scheme will be. And let me not fail to mention that none of the fashions are being produced by us. Not a one. Now, before somebody say, oh, you know what you're talking about, let me say to you, designing is not production. All right? Sewing fabric together is not production. All right? By produced, I mean the production of the natural resources that go into the manufacture of these fashion products. We have no cotton farms. We have no silk industry. We have no oil industry. And we can get one cheap from BP today. <laughs> we have no oil industry from which to gather the plastics used in fashion. No iron, steel, copper, etc. refineries to transfer the raw resources into materials ready for fabrication. <coughs> so, as a result of these things, we do have perplexity indeed. Perplexity aplenty. I call upon you, the sons and daughters of the ancient gods of Kim, to awaken and reclaim your noble heritage. Selah. I did not become someone different that I did not want to be. But I'm new here. Will you show me around? No matter how far wrong you've gone, you can always turn around. I did not become someone different that I did not want to be, but I'm new here.